You're listening to Amazing Spider-Man Chronicles episode 80, featuring Amazing Spider-Man number 224 and Uncanny X-Men number 153 from October 1981. Welcome to the 80th, wow, can you believe it, the 80th episode of Amazing Spider-Man Chronicles podcast. I am your host, a.k.a. DJ Christatos. Pat is my name. Amazing Spider-Man Chronicles is a podcast that will journal the Amazing Spider-Man comic book issues read chronologically by the release date, along with another comic book from my collection, either in digital, in a trade, or from the many lawn boxes stashed away in my basement. Each episode will provide short recaps, reviews, and ratings of the issues for that release date. The goal is to keep me actively reading through my collection and having some fun with my friends along the way talking about them. And speaking about my friends joining me for this 80th episode, we will start with Jared Elbrick, a.k.a. The Death Probe. Pat. (laughs) We got some action going on today. So, of course, I brought a joke that has to do with birds, and Jason's going to get it right off the bat because he's he's good at these things. Uh, when's the best time to buy a bird, Pat? In the spring. Mm, no. Any other takers? When the when bird cheap, is the word? When they're cheap, cheap. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I didn't get it. That's funny. Mm, that is funny. I literally Googled bad bird jokes <laughs> as you were doing the intro, <laughs> and that was the first one that came up. It's getting harder and harder to love you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so. You should have just stuck with that. All right, well, let's go to Jason, the Weasel Skull Albrick. What will you be bringing for us today? Well, just before the show, we started talking about age, and people are making fun of me because I'm the oldest person on the show and everything. And I got to admit, man, things are have been falling apart lately. My knee really hurts. And uh, fortunately, last time I went in for a checkup, the hospital just left a bunch of machine parts all around and i made myself some bird wings and then i decided to go into a life of crime so take these birdie wings nope nope, nope. let me cut off. So cut, off. Off. cut off nope. all this stuff nope. is free nope nope i'm talking nope. over it no nope. when you got nope. your stuff no nope. i'll take nope. your money why you need to read the script before nope. you do the give, it. Will give it to me oh well how, how long have you been cooking that one up Oh, I, you know, I just read the comic book a little while ago. So he didn't read the script. He didn't read a script, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> no, probably not. All right, well, let's go ahead and meet our other friend joining me for this 80th episode. It is Delvin, the Dark Web Williams. Hey, Pat, how you doing? I'm doing good, Delvin, yourself? I'm doing good. And I just want to, you know, we're all a little bit tired, you know, and just I mm, figured yeah. everybody could use just like a bedtime story, you know? to yeah, I, I just relax themselves. So if, <clears throat> if you would regale me, give me <clears throat> a second. You know, I'm just going to start right here on, on, on my fairy tale about, no, no one's going to stop me. I'm just going to. I just, I'm not even listening. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to stop you I because I got to come, yeah. come up with my own bit now because you stole my bit. So you know. <sighs> That's what you get for going last, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I follow the script. <laughs> Oh, shots <laughs> fired. <Yeah. Grip. laughs> the hell is a script? <laughs> oh, well, as much as we want to hear your story, Delvin, perhaps maybe you can say it later on and we'll we'll add it to the show. See how it goes at that point. I, I'm kind of interested to hear it as long as it's not you in the water and anything like that. It might put me to sleep as well, too. Yeah. Who wants to hear the hey, yeah. Mm-mm. Nah. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Nobody. All right. Well, since you've heard of him, he is joining us as a club member. And club members get to join us on the show as we go through as guests. We have club member Rick Heineken from Jeff and Rick Present and from the Monthly Monday Movie Muckabout Podcast. 
Rick, how are you? Thank you for joining us. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I, I would feel it's a little bad because I hadn't read anything that was here that we're supposed to do. I haven't actually learned how to read yet. But thankfully, I was able mm. to talk to somebody and he was able to telepathically teach me how to read. And so I was able to read the comic books just in time to do this episode. So that seems awfully convenient. Very convenient. Very convenient. Mm. I learned it in Russian. I took my time. That's, that could be a very <laughs> difficult, that could be very difficult because this was. I think you've got the English version, so I don't know. <laughs> you read it in the bathroom, so European. <laughs> oh, I learned pirate to read it. Our oh, word jokes are starting to look good. Aren't they? <laughs> no, actually, those are still better than the bird one. <laughs> I think we should finish. Oh yes, I agree as well too. So. Before we get started, if you want to give us a call, you can leave us a voicemail that we will play later on in the show. You can leave us a mail. You can leave us a voicemail at 707-532-5269. That number is 707-532-LBOX. Cheep, cheep. Now, before we get started with this episode's issue, let's take a quick podcast promo break and we will be right back. Spider-Man and the Cupcake Caper. Peter Parker is in Mary Jane Watson's apartment when suddenly he sees a familiar enemy. MJ, you'll have to excuse me for a minute. Uh Uh-uh. You have this thing, Tiger, and I hate it. Every time there's trouble, you disappear. Relax, MJ. All I want to do is get some milk we have with these hostess cupcakes. Uh, Sure, Peter. Anything to avoid reality, but at least this time you left me with a really delicious snack. Devil's food cake, chocolate, king creamy filling. I hate having Mary Jane think I'm a coward, but there's no other way I can slip into my Spider-Man role. And only Spidey can handle Man Mountain Marco. Don't look now, Marco. But the mountain just became a molehill. Webhead, we don't understand you, but we sure appreciate the help. Thanks, guys. Meanwhile, I've got a quart of grade A to deliver. Sorry it took me so long, MJ, but I um, got a little bit uh, distracted. Yeah. Well, no sweat, Peter. The hostess cupcakes you left me with were a lot more rewarding to me than you ever been. Brother, if she only knew. You get a big delight in every bite of Hostess Cupcakes. Welcome back from the break. Now let's get to the first featured comic for this episode. It is Amazing Spider-Man number 224. The credits for this issue are provided by Mike's Amazing World of Comics website. Publisher was Marvel. It's got a cover date of January 1982. Its on-sale date was October 6th of 1981. Cover price is 60 cents. Editor was Thomas P. DeFalco. Superstar. Oh, rock me. Writer is Roger Stern. Penciler is John Ramita Jr. Inker is Pablo Marcos. Letter is Joseph Rosen. And the colorist is Glennis Ween. Is it? Was he it's color me back colors menace ween uh, great great start already great start yes this is reprinted in uh, spider-man magazine number one from 1994 or you can find it in the spider-man's greatest villains trade paperback from 1996 backpack marvel's spider-man trade paperback as well the essential spider-man volume 10 or spider-man nothing can't stop the juggernaut hardcover or Spider-Man by Roger Stern, Omnibus. Or you can also see it on Marvel Masterworks, Volume 293 of Amazing Spider-Man, Volume 22. That's a lot. They reprinted this in the round. Wow. A lot of royalty checks for these cats. Yeah. Good for them. Cover credits are by John Romita Jr. And the inker is Bob Layton. And speaking about the cover, let's get a cover description from Jared. Here we go. The Marvel Comics Group banner has once again been replaced by your opportunity to win a 10-speed bike, Jason. Ooh. It's a yellow banner with black lettering. Spidey swings in his matching yellow corner box, and the Amazing Spider-Man logo is white with red highlights, and it includes the webs. 
The main action is highly reminiscent of one of those Olin Mills montage photos from 1989. It features a vulture. <laughs> That's a good one there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it features the vulture from lots of different angles and a solitary dangling Spider-Man. All of this is on a solid blue background. The dominant version of the vulture is a thoughtful profile shot lit only in magenta, where I'm fairly certain the vulture is thinking, so take these broken wings. I'd learn to fly again. Learn to lift so free. Now, let's round this out with a Jason game of Spot the Fake cover blurb. A, the vulture's back, deadlier than ever. B, let fly these aged wings. Or C, when we're here, the voices sing. The book of love will open up and let us in. Let us in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh. All right, Jared. Thank you for that cover description. Let's go ahead and and get into the quick cover thoughts. And we will start with our guest, Rick. What's your thoughts on this cover? Well, they really are trying to get the vulture over as being the worst, isn't aren't they? I, I haven't decided whether I like this cover or not. It's it's a lot with the vulture just everywhere. And I think it's cool looking. I think it's very pretty looking. I think it's interesting, but I'm not sure if I like it or not. Vulture's not my favorite of Spidey's rogue villains. So just putting him on the cover a lot doesn't necessarily sell it for me, but I like how it does tie into the book as far as the vultures everywhere and he can't find him. I question the vultures back deadlier than ever. Okay. So you're, oh, you're saying sliding scale. Yeah. <laughs> He's deadlier than ever, but <laughs> is he no. He's closer to dead than ever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be more appropriate. Could be, but all right, let's go ahead and go to Delvin. What's your thoughts on the cover? All right, y'all. Put a little bit of respect on the Vulture's name. I mean, if, if for no other reason that he was around when letters were invented, right? Like, So give him credit for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, I mean, he is one of Spider-Man's oldest foes. Not, like, literally in age, but, like, ever since Spider-Man was around, like, he's been beating up on the Vulture, which I did have the thought where it's like, man... Like, they better explain that this dude has, like, some amped up degree of powers because otherwise you got, like, a teenager going through his 20s just beating the crap out of a 70-year-old man. I don't care if he has wings. That's just freaking cruel. <laughs> or or a 70-year-old man beating up a 20-year-old kid. Well, okay, I, I can justify <laughs> yeah. that. Like, I don't <laughs> Come back in about 23 years or so. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just ticked off at kids. And I don't know, maybe I want to like smack a 20 year old in the face. I'm not sure yet. So I'm just going to take it that one way. Right? But other than that, like the cover itself is good. And for whatever reason, I actually like uh, Jared cracked me up the Olin Mills thing. But like it, it does look like Adrian Toomes is about to drop one of the hardest mixtapes ever. Like with, <laughs> with that side profile going on. It, but it's kind of cool. So I, I like it. It is it's almost like who drew this cover? I, I, I should have been listening. John Romita Jr. Romita. So, I mean, yep. it's a it's a good Romita cover. You could tell that he had a little bit of fun with it. And and so um, I'm OK with that. Like, I will give respect to the Vulture for him being one of Spidey's oldest foes. And I will give respect to John Romita Jr. for the cover. And hey, at least the regular artist for Spider-Man drew the cover. So there's credit for that, too. Very good. You know, I think that this reminds me of like, if it was a trading card kind of a thing, like here's a vulture and here's this side picture. And on the back, it had some bio information on it. I think that would really cool to, to be a nice picture for that. But let's go to Jason. What's your thoughts? I might be in the minority here, but I, I kind of like the vulture. I've always thought he was kind of aesthetically cool looking. And I know it's a little awkward because I think they say he's like a septuagenarian. So he's, he's in his seventies here. So like Delvin was saying, it's it's a good thing that they explained in there that he has some augmented strength somehow. I don't know exactly how he got his powers. He's obviously very smart, as we'll talk about uh, as we dive into the issue. But uh, I, I've always thought he looked pretty cool. And like Delvin said, I mean, wasn't he like I don't know, issue two or something of Amazing Spider-Man? Like he, he came out early. He's one of the OG villains. Yeah, he's an early. So you got to give some respect for that. And the book is really, 
it's kind of about him a little more so even than Spider-Man. And, and there's some, you know, some themes in there that we'll get into later. So it kind of, the cover I think is, is accurate that like Rick said, he's chasing him all over the, all over the place. So having multiple vultures on the cover, both kind of shows the, the pacing of the story. And it kind of talks about the, I guess the longevity of the character. So yeah, from the, terms of let's give some respect to the vulture as a spider-man villain i like it jared let's go over to you are you a vulture fan or are you not i kind of am i had a couple of the old spider-man 60s cartoons on vhs when i was a kid in the 80s and i'm pretty sure one of them was featured uh, vulture and i enjoyed it and yeah ever, there's been a theme with everybody's commented on it it really boils down to how much do you like the vulture on this cover and you and i talk about that on like every episode of gi joe pat we talk about yeah. the cover like it really depends on how much you like whoever's featured on the cover and i like the vulture uh just from a a uh, color wheel point of view i know you guys were hoping i'd talk about the color wheel today. i was I actually going to ask you that too i for me i like the color pops that yeah, it's, in here. it's the magenta purpley. It's uh, opposite on the color wheel is yellow, which is why it was smart to go with that with the box and the banner at the top. So those do play well off each other. And green's not bad off of it either, as you can tell. So it's not bad. It, and even though I did write the Olin Mills joke specifically to make Delvin laugh, it, it, it does make me think of that, you know, little faded in different face angles that they used to do back in the day. But it has a certain amount of charm on it, so I'm not going to hate on it. All right. Well, I appreciate all you guys' thoughts. But now, let's get into the cover ratings for this issue. As a reminder, for the last 79 episodes, we have a rating system here of a 1 through 5 rating. 5 as you loved it. It tickled your tummy feathers. And, man, these are the feathers that started it all. These are the feathers that started started it all. all. Because Spidey kicked him like square. The <laughs> so he was like, oh, my tummy feathers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, it all comes back around. Bits and bits. It just keep circle of bits. Four is you really liked it. Mm. Mm. Three, you liked it. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Two, you didn't like it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And one, you hated it. It ruffled those tummy feathers. <laughs> oh, mm. ruffles. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Mm-hmm. They don't like that at all. Let's go ahead and find out how we rated this. We'll start with our guest, Rick. I was originally going to go with a three, but uh, looking at it a bit closer and also really seeing how the colors do pop. And I got to give John Romita the credit for, for doing a really nice cover with that too and tying it in. I'll go and I'll move it up to a four. All right, Rick, starting it off with a bump up. Thank you. Let's go ahead and find out where Jason sits with this one. Well, I thought I was going to be the the high point here, but I'm going to match Rick's four. I think that if I were to hang some covers on my wall, I would have to give some serious consideration to the Spider-Man rogues gallery, right? So I think Vulture deserves to be in that rogues gallery. And I think this is a cover kind of along the lines of that Dr. Doom cover from the X-Men we talked about. It's like, wow, this is a really good representation of this villain. Okay. So um, I don't know if there's better ones out there, but this would definitely be in consideration. So I'll give it a four. I like that thought, Jason, that this is a good rep- representation of the vulture. Delvin, do you think the same? I'll read just a couple of comments from uh, the watching gallery. Bot Boy versus said, I give it an eight. Um, I'm going to assume he meant eight out of 10. If, if you extrapolate that, you know, carry the one that's four out of five. So. Uh, Kathy gave it a four. Courtney didn't like it as much, gave it a two. And Matt Passo gave it a three, says middle of the road. And so I think I'm at a three myself. It's, it's, you know, more that, you know, high level of three, you know, uh, with the possibility of sunshine later. Like, I I, I can't quite give it a four, but like, I do like the idea that uh, John Romita Jr. had with it. I thought it was real good. Jarrett, you praised the coloring on this. Where do you sit on the cover rating? I think it's just interesting to note that we've seen twos, threes, and fours, because I really think it it that's the spectrum it falls yeah. in. It has a wider spectrum than a lot of stuff. And I think it's dependent again on how much you like the vulture. And you know, if you remember all those 
old photos from the 80s and 90s, but uh, <laughs> I I'm going to give it a 3.5. No further questions. Back to you, Pat. Ooh, what, what, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't do that. Can and I will. Nope, I, 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 I have a question. I have a question, though. What is it? You, you can, you can, can he do that? No. no, Rick, you can't answer is no. not. Yes. No. I think Rick yeah. knew the answer before he asked that question. That's, <laughs> right. That's our first bylaw. Uh, I, I'll, I, you know, I'm going to stick with a three, but you know what, Pat? It's one of those strong three, strong three. Yeah. Uh, one that kind of flies high, a flying high yeah, three. Yeah, I just feel like I've seen a couple of vulture, you know, like Jason sure. said, he, he couldn't think of any better vulture covers. I feel like I, I got a couple of mine that might be better. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a happy three. Okay. I see where you're at with that. And I will, Hmm. I, I kind of toss two between that, but I will go with a four on this one. I think I like it. I like it that it has that look of the vulture in the, that silhouetted look of him. I like it. And I like the colors make it pop. So that leaves one, two, three, three cool guys. <laughs> out of, <laughs> had to do the math there. Three cool guys. <laughs> At a four and two chumps at a three. Just weird how that always works out. It is, it is so strange. <laughs> hey, I just count them up. That's the way the math works out with that. Now that we've got the cover description and our thoughts out of the way, let's move on into the story synopsis. And that's brought to you by Delvin. While attending a demonstration in radiology, high school student Peter Parker was bitten by a spider which had accidentally been exposed to radioactive rays. Through a miracle of science, Peter soon found that he had gained the spider's powers and had, in effect, become a human spider. A Spider-Man. Stanley presents The Amazing Spider-Man. The title of this issue is Let Fly These Agent Wings. The action, as it were, starts with Pete setting a date with the lovely Aunt May, who we find out is engaged to Nathan Lubinsky, who she met at the Restwell Nursing Home. Action does pick up a bit when Spidey stops some robbers from getting away with a bank heist. I'm sure the owner of the bank was all, thank you for being a friend. Yes, I'm making it that obvious. We then move to Bellevue Hospital, where Nathan is convalescing and makes friends with one Adrian Toombs, known as the Vulture to you, Sonny Boy. Nathan inadvertently motivates Toombs to recapture his youth, as it were, and so Toombs finds some old busted parts and makes some wings and takes off. You could say he rose to the occasion. And as he keeps rising, because he starts a great series of heists all over town, Peter finds out about it as he's trying to make some photos at the Bugle and gets interrupted by JJJ and Lance Bannon, causing him to blanch. Spidey fails to find Vulture as Vulture didn't exactly come after him, so Pete goes to rest well as he promised May. While May sits on the Sophia, <clears throat> Pete goes to say hello to Nate, and guess who's there too? Nate's friend, Adrian, the Vulture. Eventually, a fight ensues in the nursing home where Spidey and Vulture knock through some walls, windows, and door of these. <clears throat> and the end of the battle sees Vulture accidentally accosting Nathan and letting him go as Nathan is the guy who gave Vulture his groove back. Vulture flees as Spidey was accosted by a bunch of senior citizens who were thanking him for saving the day. Back to you, Pat. I, I got to jump in, Pat, and remind everybody that the whole Nathan Lubinsky storyline is carried over from an issue of Spornacular Spider-Man. <laughs> Spornacular. <laughs> That's for the yes. the deep, the Dorothy's last name. Okay, back to yeah. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> I should have caught that ahead it's of time. Spornac. It's, it's so spornac. I said Spornacular yeah, Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get these. Oh, I'm, with a, I'm, I'm with you now. I'm with you. Uh, oh, what a golden reference. <laughs> oh, just, man. Just hanging out with the girls here, aren't we? Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Delwin, for that story synopsis. Let's go ahead and get into the bricker brack for this issue. Is it a first read or a reread? Rick, first read or reread? First read. Jared. First read, I believe, Pat. Jason. First read. Delvin? 
First read, Pat. <gasps> it's a first read for me, too. Woo! It's a reading rainbow. Reading rainbow. <laughs> oh, man. What a great episode this is starting out to be. We got Glennis. We got a reading rainbow. This is We awesome. got me. We got three cool guys and two chumps. We got everything going on here. What could we ask for more? We'll find out. Speaking about more, let's go ahead and get to some high lows or what does. We'll start off with Rick again on our high low or what the for your first round. I'll start off with a high. One of the things I really like about some of the older comic books that are out there, something that seems to be lost a lot with some of the newer ones is the great action pieces where you actually see character or characters going through some awesome motions and you can actually see them connected. And we've got a great one here at the beginning with Spidey versus the bank robbers. And then later on when he's actually fighting the vulture himself, there's great movement, great action. And you also get the, the, the thought bubbles as well with him kind of thinking about the things he's got to do or thinking about what he's got to also take care of. You know, I need to take care of this so I can take care of my aunt, make sure that they're all okay as well. There's a lot of frenzied motion and frenzied action that goes on in these scenes, and it's really well done. Once again, props to Ramita Jr. for fantastic art, but I just I like seeing this, and I think it's a lost skill in a lot of the modern comics nowadays. Totally agree with you on that. Uh, this was full of action, and the panels did not disappoint with that. Jared, what's a high, low, or what the for this round? I am going to pick a the highest of lows. And, <laughs> and I mean, I can't remember we're alive, so we can't really bleep. Uh, Lance Bannon being a low-key turd. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, no, Pete, you didn't double-check that light. How bad for you? Well, I guess my bank robbery picture is going to come out just fine. <laughs> Oh man, he reminded me of he reminded me of the dude that took Debbie Whitman. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I I mean it's it's in contention for my silly spidey moment, although I, I don't think I'm gonna pick that, but I just had to give it up for that Lance Bannon moment of him, you know, <laughs> being that that friend of me, right? That uh, hey buddy, maybe next time you should you knew all the while he was being a turn to, to Pete. So, yeah, yeah and I just want to underline uh, what Rick said. Yeah, the art flow in this is great. It's great. And it is kind of a lost uh, art, as you said. So agree with Rick and love the Lance Bannon moment. Yeah, there are definitely some good character moments throughout this one that I really enjoyed as well, too. Delvin, what's your high, low, or what the for this round? I'm going to give a high to um, Adrian Toomes, the vulture. They... Could have played him like, you know what I mean? They mentioned septuagenarian, so he's somewhat in his 70s. Got it. But the repeated theme that they gave, like, at first, you know, they it felt like, you know, maybe folks at the nursing home, whether it was inadvertent or not, were making him feel like he was basically at death's door and he had nothing else to contribute. And the rest of that issue, especially after he made those makeshift wings and took off, which was an incredible feat, by the way, if you think about that, he just took trash and turned it into something that he could literally fly with that would be that's an incredible thing for anyone at any age to do but the thing the beat that i want to pick up on is that when peter saw him and in his head made him out to be the vulture the vultures old school bad guy criminal instincts kicked in is like this dude knows who i am i'm yeah. made and he was already taking steps like, I'm about to knock this dude off and drop him off of a building. <laughs> like, I, that was some straight up, just awesome, instinctive things. And it showed kind of what a wily character that Adrian the Vulture is. And it was very much appreciated. Yeah, that guy still got some evilness in him and uh, could definitely pull it off with his age and all that. Speaking about older people, I like. Aunt May's boyfriend now, or fiance now, too. Nathan. Nathan, yeah. We've seen him in some previous issues. Now we get to see him again coming back, and I just I just like his attitude. He's like, hey, buddy, I'm all have cool. We, have we seen Nathan in Amazing Spidey? 
He's been in spec a lot, but not in a main. I feel like we did, did we a spec st- somewhere. We did an issue of spec for, I don't know, maybe a long box or something. Uh, maybe. I, I thought we seen him earlier on. Like, wasn't he at the, the whole Aunt May story of the, you know, the. Oh, the like rock the. Band? The, no, you they they did yeah. like at one yeah, of the band that came. vignette where yeah. it was like that Aunt May story, but I don't remember whether Nate was okay. there. Or not. He was in or not. I know we at one point did a spec Spidey, and he was in that. Maybe then and I just maybe it that's must have I'm been a long confused. box, or maybe yeah. I was podcasting with other people. It could it could be. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, I, I like how you know Aunt May's got some some fun stuff going on there. I, I guess really what I like is just the hijinks and stuff that are always happening at Aunt May's. The old homestead like that. Lots of stuff happening there. Jason, you got a high lower with her. Yeah, I'll just kind of continue uh, what Delvin started talking a little bit about the vulture. I like the theme of this book about just aging, right? What makes a good villain is a compelling story arc. And him battling his his age is something that touches on all of us. You know, I mean, as I'm getting up there and I've got more runway behind me than I have have in front of me. It's something that you think about. And you know, there's that scene in there that really struck me when he just throws his cane away. He's like, I ain't using this thing anymore. And I just like both Nate and Tombs. Now, you know, Tombs uses it to do bad things, but they're refusing to go into that good night quietly. You know, I got to say, I really respected the vulture a little bit, even though, again, he's doing bad things and Spidey's got to stop him. There was a little piece of me when you turn that page and you see him flying around that hospital with those MacGyvered wings. He built going, you go, boy, you go, you show him. So that was a good little bit of storytelling and a high from me. I'm like, where are these big rooms at? He's got enough room to kind of fly around. And I just good for him. Good for him. And he's got that electronical thing to put together. Like Delvin said, to take all that stuff and just make his wings and fly. Smart guy. We'll go back to round two. Rick, do you have a high, low, or a what the? I think I'm going to go with a low on this one here. I wasn't really a big fan of the overall story, and that's just because when it came to it, I felt that as I started reading the story, I knew exactly where it was going to end. There was nothing really suspensable about it. There was As soon as they started with Pete saying that he was going to see his aunt at the retirement center, and we started seeing the vulture, He's going to be put in retirement or he's at the retirement center. I'm like, oh, okay. They're on a collision course for wackiness. I don't know. I've seen the story before. I knew exactly what beats were coming. Maybe it's just me. I'm cynical. I've read these kinds of things too much. Or it just, it didn't seem that there was a really compelling overarching story here. I will say that I do agree with Weasel Skull and how he was, how they were really portraying Dumas and, and his fight against old age. It's just, the setup for how him and Pete were going to cross paths. Yeah. Saw that for about the second page. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry for bringing on a low on that one, but that was the one, my one problem with this book is I, I just knew exactly where it was going. I knew somehow he was going to be put in a situation where he was going to be able to get wings and break mm-hmm. out of here. And, and they were going to have a fight based upon the retirement center. Yeah. I can kind of understand where you're coming from as we've been reading these things. I think what I find more fascinating with is that this action he kind of is more of the filler i think the stuff that's really happening is the the j joan jameson stuff the the background other things of peter's life Mm -hmm. is kind of the ongoing thread that i'm looking forward to and his fight with the vulture is just like eh, it's some action that he had to get you know some action he beat that he had to get to but they're continuing to make those building of those different side stories that are going on and i enjoyed that part of it Jared, you got a high low or what the? I have, I guess, one of the biggest what does maybe we've ever done on the show. Because what I want to do is remind everybody that this book that came out in what was it, 1981, something like that. You read it. I wasn't paying attention. This book that came out in the early 80s features the vulture, right? And so the vulture is going to be back. And Amazing Spider-Man several times throughout the years, and he's going to hurt people, and he's going to steal things, and he's going to break things, and and most of all, hurt people. And really, it's all Nathan Lubinsky's fault, because he was mm. ready to retire, and Nathan was like, no, <laughs> go get him, kid! So, yeah, everything from here forward that the Vulture does, Nate's fault. Thanks for the pep talk, Nate, you So, uh, 
jerk of the issue, the award for jerk of the issue, jerk of all time award goes to Nathan. Nate. Yeah. Nathan. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Way to go, Nate. Thanks for your pep talk. You read you just the wrong had, you just, on that one, buddy. You just had to have another poker buddy. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> but what if, what if the overall thing is like Nate, is like some bigger my, mastermind the guy where he's like controlling yeah. all. <laughs> he's actually things. the rose. <laughs> <laughs> it all starts here. Redcon, wow. Redcon. Wow. <laughs> Nate, you mastermind. <laughs> I love it. This is probably like us, Pat. Like a Posse cast out there has probably inspired some villain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of our Posse cast episodes. I'll show you. The same thing that what Nate did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, perk up, buddy. <laughs> It's going to be what I tell the cops why I went evil. I listened to this podcast yeah. show. Yeah, this podcast just, told me I could do whatever I wanted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, at least we're doing some good. People are listening. All right. Well, let's go ahead to Delvin. You got a high, low, or what the? Uh, more of the what the variety. And it's going to piggyback a little bit off of what Rick said of, yep, we, we need a story. An amazing Spider-Man, right? There hadn't been a story in a while. And so what I'm hoping is by bringing in a let's say a minus to B plus level villain like the vulture that we're going to start something because as, as, as it seemed like this didn't end in a definitive win for either vulture or the spider or the Spider-Man <laughs> or Spider-Man like Spidey didn't catch the bad guy and the bad guy got away vowing revenge on Pete. So maybe something's going to be going on there and we'll see how that builds. Like, yeah, using you know my um, the few memories that I remember from Spidey coming up uh, six issues from now, uh, we got a pretty big one, and on about uh, fourteen or fifteen from now, we're gonna start storyline with a major new Amazing Spider-Man foe um, at the time anyway. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if there's a story that builds in between now and again, because that would seem like a heck of a long time to just kind of mill about, uh, as it were. Uh, one last thing, uh, like I doubt that we're going to be uh, doing Amazing Spider-Man Chronicles when these storylines come about. But two people in this book wound up meeting a tragic fate uh, at some point or the other. So it was also interesting uh, seeing that part of it, you know, from this side of it, where those characters are still alive. Delvin, never say never. You know, come on, just put your chin up, buddy. We can do it. Yeah, man. Just Throw the pain away. Yeah. Keep podcasting. If the you vulture, if the vulture can have a life outside of the retirement center, we can too. Exactly. You, you know yeah. what? You, you guys are right. And don't pay any attention to the news in Charlotte later. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Go rob something. <laughs> yeah. uh, Delvin, this is live. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, on that note, let's go ahead and talk to Jason. You got a high, low, or a what the? I'll give it another high. I really appreciate the character of Peter Parker and Spider-Man and their 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 blended lives, right? And I think this issue really kind of encompasses the responsibility that Peter has both to pursue and bring the vulture to justice alongside with his responsibility to take care of his Aunt May and those responsibilities he has, even if it's something just as simple as showing up for the Saturday dinner. I think that there are very few characters in comic books today that really encompass that blending the two worlds and how he has to juggle those things together. And you mix in the him trying to make some money. He's already invested in the new camera lens. He's all, all set and ready to, to make some bank off these photos. And then he just gets kind of, you know, Short circuited there in the end. Lance. It's Lance. Stupid Lance. I think this is one of those issues that really show those merging of the two worlds really well. And I I want to point out the scene where Aunt May's thinking to herself, like, oh, I thought he was over this irresponsibility, right? So she's got thoughts that she doesn't say to Peter, but she's she's thinking them. So as the as the reader, we're really seeing that struggle, that tension between the world of Spider-Man and the world of Peter Parker. And I always like that. I always appreciate those elements of the story. I definitely agree with you on that too. This was a good one where it started off like Peter is on his high Parker high. And then all of a sudden brrr, you start to see the Parker bad luck start to come back in and just kind of bring him down a little bit more, but not as bad as it has been. But 
maybe like Delvin said, is this building up to something even bigger where eventually it would be further down and have to rise back up again. Maybe Nate will help him on that too. Get him, you know, give him a pep talk, Nate, and get that Spider-Man back swinging around and do what he needs to do. With that, then let's go ahead and roll into silly Spidey moment. Well, we will find out the silliest Spidey moment in this issue. And let's go to Rick. Do you have a silly Spidey for this issue? Yeah, when he's taking out the bank robbers and he's messing with them the entire time. But I, I like the one part. Anyone for a fast game of Leapfrog? No? Geez, what a bunch of stick in the muds you are. So I, I like the stick in the muds. That's, as he's that was a good one. Yes. Knocking them to the ground. That was definitely going on. There was a one of, in there. There's also two where he, he makes some kind of other funny moment. I thought just all his quips in that whole scene was mm. would be my Spidey moment for that. Yeah. Jert, do you have a silly Spidey? Of course, sir. I texted it to you guys. <laughs> I took a screenshot of it and I texted it to you guys. So when the vulture shows up at the medical center and he first meets Nate and Nate is over there in a bathtub and he yells at him from across a rather large room. That's hey, one would do. Yeah. You're the new kid on the block. And Tombs goes, eh? and he goes, come over here and we'll chew the fat while I'm in the rinse cycle. <laughs> and I think I wrote, I said, you guys, I wrote to this as my caption. How about no, you creepy old bastard. <laughs> like what the, what the heck? man? It's like, you're in the bathtub. And like, you meet some of Hey, come on over here. <laughs> I'm come, in the tub. Don't dip come. your old prunes in this water with me. <laughs> like, I was just re- I was so relieved when I found out he was wearing swimming trunks. <laughs> I was just like, what? Uh, anyway. A- actually, actually, Jared, he was naked, but off panel. Yeah. They made him put on the trunk. <laughs> yeah, the, the Comic Code Authority came in and they drew in the purple shorts there on that last panel. Or maybe because other, up a- until that point in time, it was it was commando style. Yeah. This is a panel of the missing where Tombs actually is like, hey, hey, buddy, put these on. <laughs> <laughs> I will continue hey. to talk to you if you cover up the Johnson. <laughs> hey, come on over here, man. I'm in the tub. Let's chat. No. No. Anyway, that's it. You mean we all didn't meet friends that way? Is it just me? I mean. <laughs> Pat, you, Pat, we're live. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on then. Jason, what's your silly spidey? Oh, I like this the scene when he's trying to develop those photos and J. Jonah Jameson just ruins the whole thing by opening the door. And he like, I forget the word he uses, but like, which idiot? Open Ignoramus. The door. <laughs> Ignoramus. Yeah, Ignoramus, yeah. And uh, J. Jonah Jameson was like, oh, you might want to think about who you're calling an Ignoramus here. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny. That yeah, was a good one. Definitely. <laughs> Plant spamming. Oh, no, Pete. <laughs> Oh, there's a short right here. Oh no, who could have guessed? <laughs> and and the, the the short on the light is just him knocking it, screwing it kind of back into place because he just yes. unscrewed yeah. it just yes. a little yes. bit and just you know. Oh that Lance. Delvin, do you have a silly Spidey? Yep, nice little pun. Um I thought Rick was about to take it when he was talking about the puns during the heist, but it was funny uh when the getaway guy was you know trying to get away and found out he couldn't and the guys and spidey says good morning sir fill her up should i check under the hood oh i see you are a hood see it's a play on words yeah the mm, hood yes, of the car yeah. but hood also meaning a bad and, guy and, like, and he was also wearing a hood yeah I, or yeah. like like cheap was something a bird would say but it's also the cost you'd want to purchase <laughs> no i don't uh, double oh, entendre. No, 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 don't no, get that's it. not, that's not <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I still don't get it. Okay, never mind. Uh, now that we got the silly Spidey moments out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the ratings for this issue. As a reminder, again, it is a one through five rating. Five as you loved it. It tickled your tummy feathers. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Four, you really liked it. Three, you liked it. Mm. Two, didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And one, you hated it. It ruffled those tummy feathers. Mm. Oh, just mm, that... Uh, counterclockwise. Don't do that. Ugh, wow. You know, and, and if you're going to do it, just, ugh, just, and don't ask for me to get in the tub. Yeah. Nothing like wet, soggy feathers in a tub. Ugh, I hate it. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into <laughs> that rating. We'll go with a Rick one through five for this issue. Sorry. I'm having trouble getting the, the soggy tummy feathers out of my head. Now I'm going to go ahead and go with the three on this one. I can't really get by the bad overall or not bad. I guess just, predictable storyline elements of it. I like the individual action moments of it. I like a lot of the parts of this, but 
I kind of wanted just a little bit meat on the bone of the story. It was a little too stringy and uh, old and, you know, kind of like the vulture. Ah, uh, I see what you're doing there. See what yes. I did there, yeah. No, yes, yes. some right. tendons and. Mm. I'm, I'm going to go back on mute here. Then I'm just going to go back on mute now. Okay, it's gamey, gamey. <laughs> well, Jason, since you got the mic, what's your score? I agree with Rick. This is about a three and a solid three for me. Real middle of the road, and yeah, Delvin brought it up. I, I, I need a good story arc, man. It has been a minute, so waiting, waiting, waiting. Jarrett, are you going to meet us, meet them at a three, or are you going to go higher or lower? Oh, man, I I am tempted to bump up here because I do feel like it's your average run the mill three storyline. But I like the fact that it's been talked about that we focused on the story of getting older. You know, it, when you're a kid and you read vulture stories, you're like, it's the old man. And then, like Jason said, when you start getting old like us, we're like, oh, uh, tell me more. You know, <laughs> I'm interested in that. And I always like it when the villains interact with Peter instead of Spider-Man, because now Peter's got to cook up what, what, where he's been and all that stuff, too. And, and that blurred, you know, no, line sure. between it, it being Spider-Man and Peter. So, you know what? I, let me just let me just raise it up. Because if Joe November was here, I'd give it a 3.5. But I, I almost pulled the trigger on the cover. I will pull it on the story. I will give it a four, although I totally agree with Jason. We've been given a lot of episodes with no story arcs lately, so we need to get back to that. But I'm going to use up all the positivity I have left on this episode for this moment. Okay. So I hear you're at a four for what you're saying, right? Mm-hmm. All yep. right. Delvin, are you at a four or a three, or where are you at? I was thinking three, but you know what? Actually, before we get to mine, I'm going to read some of the comments. I got four of them. Matt Passo gave it a three. He says, like the cover, this one is a three. Barely. Courtney says that she will bump up the story to a three. So I guess she was not liking it, but we convinced her. Eric Porta says three. Roger Stern's Spider-Man's run is underrated, in my opinion. I agree with you. Roger Stern has written some very good Spider-Man stories. Absolutely, Eric. I totally agree with you on that. And Bot Boy Versus also gives it a three. I am inspired by Jared's positivity here. Uh, the last remnants of positivity that he has for this episode. Uh, and, and I will bump it up to a four because there were some things that I, that I liked. We often talk about how Spider-Man's universe uh, has almost as an important role in his whole canon as Spider-Man does. And this is one of those cases. I like that Spider-Man made his appointment to meet Aunt May because a lot of times... There's this old trope where Spider-Man, the dude who's all about ultimate responsibility, blows off like 75% yeah. of his commitments. And it's like, is he really that responsible then? Because it's like, did you really have to stop that bank robber? It's like, I can't, I understand how, like, why you could have or, 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 or if you see it that you have to stop it. But no, you don't have to go patrolling 15 minutes before you go to that appointment and, and then, then get, into the tr- get into the trouble. So Time management. I, Right. So I, I like that he, he made the commitment to see his aunt. I like the beat that they had with the vulture being an absolutely wild, wily old man. And I like the fact that it didn't necessarily end cleanly, that it kind of left a to be continued. So there are a lot of things to, to like in the story. And I hope I will be even more convinced that the four was a great call if in t- uh, issues from 225 to about 230 or so that we pick back up on this story so I'll, I'll, I'll give it a four all right well you do make some compelling um points for the, that four and and the story that is going on but i think there is a big theme and i see what's going on here i am going to be at a three so we are at another stalemate of three cool guys at a three and two chumps at a four doesn't sound like a stalemate to me it sounds like uh we outvote them because yeah three, well yeah Pretty cool guys. We'll see how the next issue it, goes. It, Rick, it, it's all about who's on the same team with Pat. I don't know if you figured that out. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's not. It's not Gosh, at all, Gary. You know it's what? just the, the numbers. Well, times it's been you know, on the same. I no, I don't see the connection. I don't see the connection at all. <laughs> it's just the numbers. Shenanigan. Jared Pat Pat texted me and he prefers to be called Rogue Agent Champion Pat. Oh. <laughs> 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 you refer to him. It really the plaque rolls is off in the, the area. The plaque's really? not in yet, so. 
until I can display that up there. Anyway, let's go ahead and move forward. Now, before we get into Karma Count with Albert Norris, I want each of you guys to give us a guess of how many Karma points he will be giving Spider-Man. And we will start with Jason. Well, he lets, well, he doesn't let, but Vulture gets away. So that's going to cost him. We know that. He did stop the robbery at the beginning. So there is that minimal property damage. He makes his commitment with May. So all in all, we should be at positive. I'll say he's going to get 30. He's going to get 30 <laughs> karma points for this. Delvin. <sighs> Bad guy gets away in the end. There's a lot of property damage that occurred. I don't think it's going to be very high for this one. I'm going to say 35. Rick? Um, I like how everybody's been thinking. I'm going to go and land on 30. Three? 30. 30. 30. All right. Jared? Honestly, 30 was what I was thinking, but since both Rick and Jason are at 30, I'm going to go 29. And I will go 25. That's a smart move, Pat. I yeah, like, I, you finally because, figured out how this works. Yeah, yeah. Even though I, it screwed me, I, I like how you figured out how this works. I still don't know, but I was I was like 25. He ain't yeah, going to get a lot just, for just, so just, to get off of, just, to, <laughs> just to get off of uh, Jason's 30, I'm going to go 31. I'll, I'll do 31. Just Okay. It. All right. Well, here we go. Let's go ahead and find out. I guess I'm your karma. And I love it. I can't get enough of it. There's nothing above it. Hi, Crusaders. This is Auburn Elvis. Have you ever wondered if superheroes can improve their strength by working out? Well, according to the 1984 Marvel superhero role-playing game, they can. But it ain't easy. In the game, heroes gain and lose karma points for how heroic their actions are. Karma can be saved up over time and spent to improve a hero's ability scores. Improving an ability costs 10 times its current score. So, if Spider-Man wanted to improve his strength of a 42 or 41, it would cost him 400 karma. And to give you an idea of how long it would take Spidey to earn that much karma, here's the karma Count for his actions in this issue. Amazing Spider-Man 224 starts off with Peter having an encouraging phone conversation with Aunt May. Full of energy, Peter decides to do some web slinging during this beautiful day. He soon spots a pack of bank robbers that end up posing little challenge for our hero. Spidey gains 20 karma for stopping the robbers, 10 karma for their arrest, and another 5 for the jokes he cracked during the encounter. After that, he heads off to the bugle in the hopes of selling the photos he just took. The story cuts to a scene that shows you why you never leave the vulture alone with any sort of technology. Then back over to Peter at the Daily Bugle, where J. Jonah Jameson and Lance Bannon ruin the photos Peter was developing, probably costing our hero some karma. For the next few days, the vulture terrorizes New York, knocking over several high-profile mercantile centers. Spidey is consistently a few steps behind the villain, so Webb Hebbett is forced to call off his search and decides to visit Aunt May at the nursing home. Peter gains five karma for keeping the promise to visit Aunt May. Parker Luck rears its ugly head once again as the Vulture has been hiding in the same nursing home. After tussling with the Vulture as Peter, Spidey changes into costume and does battle with his foe among the home's many elderly residents. The battle causes enough property damage to cost Spidey five karma and end up endangering Aunt May's boyfriend, Nathan. Vulture's newfound friendship with Nathan prevents the villain from carrying through on his threats, and when he bolts from the scene, it technically counts as a win for Spidey, and he gains 30 karma for preventing a violent crime. Peter even shows up at the end to reassure Aunt May that he hadn't ditched her, ensuring that he keeps that 5 karma he received earlier for making this visit. So adding all that up, Spider-Man earns a total of 65 karma in this issue, which isn't bad considering half this issue was an AARP commercial. If Webhead were to do this kind of thing five more times, he'd earned enough karma to improve his strength from a 40 to a 41. I'm Auburn Elvis. I thank you very much for listening to this karma count. Play us some of those sweet nursing home tunes, Joe November. I guess I'm your karma. And I love it. I can't get enough of it. There's nothing above it. Huh. Wow, we are way off. We suck. the winner. <laughs> He didn't mention the damage, the property damage at the nursing home. He, he mentioned not, it. He, did. he, he mentioned didn't take it. us points. He, he also gave points. three. He also gave thirty points for winning or for for technically beating the vulture. Mm. I think that we we're if we we all disagreed with that. If we took out those three points, we were all the right ballpark there. All right. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, let's not take away though from the fact that I did win. You did win. You, you did. did. You did. I, I, I almost yeah. never once suspected that at some point we'd be dissecting every one. Of <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. 
<laughs> he got a boot in the chat too. That I just want to put that out there. <laughs> oh well, well thank we you. appreciate it though. Yeah, we definitely. Yeah, it's very nice. Very nice. Uh, it's a game within the game. Now here we go. And that's going to bring us to the end of this part of the show. You got a comment or a question, send us an email at contact at longboxcrusade.com to make a comment on the Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook page. And we'll find it there as well, too. With that, we will be right back. Jeff and Merck present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack, where we journey through each issue of the most underrated Marvel series of the 80s while drinking beer, analyzing awesome and amazing adolescent adventures, and absorbing alcohol. We got kids with powers, we got villains with attitude. We got superhero guests, like all of them from the Marvel Universe. We have thematically appropriate beer reviews. We have good jokes and bad song parodies. One stop for all your Power Pack pod-pleasing procurements. And we got alliteration. Find Unpacking the Power of Power Pack wherever fine podcasts are played. Costumes on. Welcome back to the break. Now let's get to the second featured comic for this episode, which is determined by the Crusader Club members. Club members get to vote on this segment using the online poll only available on the Longbox Crusade page at patreon.com. As always, we want to thank our Crusader Club members for voting to help determine the programming for this show. If you want to get in on that voting, and all the other amazing benefits for being a Crusader Club member, just head on over to patreon.com and search for Longbox Crusade. You can join us for as little as $1 per month. That's $1. And you get to vote and have some fun and to determine what issue we will have during this episode. For this episode, the Crusader Club members selected Uncanny X-Men number 153. The credits for this issue are provided by Mike's Amazing World of Comics website. Thank you, and we miss you, Mike. The publisher was Marvel. It's got a cover date of January 1982. Its on-sale date was October 13th, 1981. Cover price, 60 cents. Editor is Louise Simonson. Writer is Chris S. Claremont. Penciler is Dave Cockrum. Anchor is Joseph Rubenstein. Letters is Tom Orzakowski and the Color Me Bad colorist, Glennis Ween. Woo! Glennis! Told you there's some good. Told you. We got to come up with something for a double Glennis, you know? Double we got yeah. we got the double rainbow. There needs to be something cool for a double Glennis. We do. We do. We need something like that when there's double Glennis. Somebody help us out there. You and Listener Land, help us out. Tell us what we should do for a double Glennis. We always enjoy her colors. You can read along with us in X-Men Classic 57, Essential X-Men Volume 3, Marvel Visionaries, Chris Claremont, still doing it, Marvel Milestone, Beast in Kitty Pride, Marvel Masterworks Volume 151 of the Uncanny X-Men Volume 7, or the Uncanny X-Men Omnibus Volume 2, and X-Men Epic Collection called I, Magneto. Cover credits go to Dave Cockrum. Inker is Joseph Rubenstein. And speaking about the cover, let's get a cover description from Jared. Uh, no thanks, Pat. Back to you. All right, Jared. Thank you for that cover description. Now let's go into our all quick haters, cover all thoughts. All haters. All right. I'm going to go ahead and just jump in here right away because we got Kitty Pride standing in front of a kind of a looks like some torn up uh, movie posters, and there's ones kind of like says X Men, and you've got Kitty and Colossus dressed up kind of like pirates swinging. You've got Aurora who has a sorceress and you've got kind of a cloud version behind her. There's a little nightcrawler. There is Bamfs on that poster. There's a poster off to the side with the kind of characterized version of Wolverine that we're going to have in this issue. And we have a little Lockheed Dragon down at the bottom of, of this uh, poster. And Kitty Pride's standing in front of it in her X-Men class uniform holding a cola and popcorn saying, and now for something completely different, because this is a, a takeoff issue. This is kind of an aberration issue, if you will. That's my little cover description for you, Jared. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and now Rick. everyone knows why I didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know what you mean by aberration or whatever. But that, that's a big word for me, Rick. It is a great <laughs> word. Thank you, Rick, though, for doing that cover description. We do appreciate it. Uh, you know, this one kind of reminds me, when I see them swinging like that, I want to picture like Kurt doing it, right? Because Kurt mm-hmm. was always that swashbuckling kind of a, a of a guy that you would always see him like in that, you know, he always would kind of have that Earl Flynn, wasn't yeah. it? That he would kind of 
mm-hmm. hologrammy kind it, of things. It's it's interesting that you would mention that because kind of from some of the parts of this book, there is a Nightcrawler mini series that comes off of it, really featuring a lot of these Bamfs and that uh, ah, little okay. mini Wolverine. They're all kind of uh, tied into that, but he has his own little mini series where he does a lot more of that swashbuckling esque okay. type of a of the thing. I like this cover a lot. In fact, I've got my own copy of it signed by Chris Claremont because this is a cover that I have up on my wall. I like this because this is a a different way of looking at the X Men. Uh, it's a different story with the X Men, and I like that Kitty Pride is breaking the fourth wall here in talking about what's going on inside the issue and that she is telling a story. This is a very true cover of describing what you're going to see on the inside. It's Kitty telling a story, Kitty telling uh, her own, it's kind of presented here like it's a movie, Mm -hmm. but sure. It's kind of like a a story that she's telling. It's something that's outside of what really is true inside the world of 616 X-Men. And this is an opportunity for her to tell that story. And the cover does a good job of representing that. It's fun. It's interesting. It's entertaining. So I like this cover a lot. Thank you, Rick, for your excitement about this one. You were excited to be on this particular episode for this particular issue. But let's go ahead and find out. Delvin, what's your thoughts? I don't mind the cover. It definitely is a table setter. It's telling you that this is not going to be the seriousness of last cover. Because last cover, you know, we had the cat fight going on. This is clearly going to be a palate cleanser book. It gives that feel of like a editorial bullpen type book, like except that it's um a part of a main series of sp- and not just like a one off or something like that or a not brand X or a damage control, you know, something silly like that. So I mean, it, it puts it gives you that mindset and then even gives you that caption that says and hey, now for something completely different. So they did set the table for it in the book and they did deliver on it in the book. All right. Jared, let's get your thoughts out of the way. Yeah, let's do that. I'm really glad that Captivating Kathy Brighton, the MVP, is in the chat today because <laughs> she put in the chat, and I quote, I have no idea what is happening. There's too much going on for me. Since she said, it seems I'm the chat anchor at a two on this cover, which is interesting. We'll get to scores in a minute. But I do want to address what she said. There's too much going on. You know what, though? As a warning, it's a good cover to let you know, just skip this issue. But, uh, yeah, it's... I, there's too much going on. There's not enough <laughs> continuity for me. Uh, I do like the fact that Kitty's in her best costume to date, though. We've talked about her bad yeah, costume. Yeah, this is a good costume. I it's like a this good one. costume. Yeah, and I mean, it's Cockrum. So Solid. There'll be, a, there'll be a certain amount of respect there, but otherwise, I take it much more as a warning. I like the red banner and red label at the top as if to say, wah, 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 skip it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Told you, this is going to be rough. <laughs> it's gonna be, all right. Well, let's move on then. Go to your brother. Will he say something different about this cover? Artistically, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it looks visually pretty striking. We've talked about Kitty Pride in, in the classic uniform. I like that. I like her looking like a teen, kind of a teenage girl with the popcorn and the, and the movie soda. I think... Now, two thoughts. Number one, as we continue this track, man, Chris Claremont and or Marvel Comics is really trying to promote Kitty Pride. Really trying to promote Kitty Pride to the point where she's a character who I like and it's annoying me. To me, it's not until Kitty Pride and Wolverine that I become a true fan of, of Kitty's. But we're still trying. I can tell you from a marketing perspective, as somebody who bought X-Men kind of religiously, I don't have this issue. And, and I can tell you that there's probably a reason why I don't. I've passed it up just because, you know, it doesn't make me want to pick up to buy the book. Now, you know, and now for something completely different, right? I'm not sold. It's screaming filler issue. Pass me by. Uh, I think that kind of goes along with Jared's warning. Now, as we get into the story, I'm going to be a little more forgiving of it. But as a cover, artistically, looks pretty good. From a marketing standpoint, 
it's a little problematic for me. So that's going to all factor into my score. Well, all right. I definitely will agree with you on the art of the cover. I like the lines and and the coloring on it. I, I think there's a lot of passion that was done in the artwork on it. With that, let's go ahead and find out our cover ratings. It is a one through five rating on this one. It is five. You loved it. It gave you a ring to swing from. Mm-hmm. Four. You really liked it. Mm-hmm. Two. Liked it. Yeah, yeah. Two. Didn't like it. And one. You hated it. It mm-hmm. turned you into a baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Rick. One through five on the cover. Yeah, I'm going to be the homer for this one. I've got, like I said, I've got the signed copy. This does go up on my wall, and I like it. This this has a lot of nostalgia in it for me. That's probably a good portion of it as well when I see this cover, and I, I know what the story is going to be inside, and that makes me happy. So I'm going to go full on five on this one. Well, that's awesome. Good. I, and you know what? Sometimes nostalgia just gives you that extra boost, and if it means something to you, that's great. We'll go ahead and go to Delvin, one through five. I want to say that is legit awesome that uh, Rick loves it to a tune of a five. I also want to say that for whatever odd reason, and it wasn't for like me not liking it, uh, the issue or whatever, I don't have this in my collection. And for like the last year plus, I've had like all the X-Men and it's like, the guy was like, oh yeah, 149, 150, 151, 152. Like, wait, I don't have 153. Huh? Okay, weird. <laughs> Just one of those weird coincidences. Uh, I give the cover a three. I think it's good. I don't have anything against the cover at all. It's it looks silly. Uh, and every now and again, when you read one of those books, like sometimes, you know, as we've said often, sometimes you do have to eat the filler. And like as a completionist, I am at some point going to get this book because I, I should. It, it's not like the cover alone wouldn't preclude me from getting it. So I give it a three. Uh, real quick, too, from the comment section, I don't know whether people were trolling or not. And I, because again, as Rick already expressed his love and affectation for it, but Matt Paso is also a fan. Rick, if you haven't read the comments, he says this cover gets all the points. So he loves it. Courtney Holland also gave it a five. It said cover was a five. Bot Boy Versus says beautiful cover, five from me. We've already talked about uh, Kathy's, but uh, she just said, I have no idea what's happening. Too much going on for me. Seems I'm the chat anchor and gave it a two herself. So uh, we are um, a podcast divided on this one. It seems like some people uh, just are. Wait, one more. Scott O'Neill says two. I agree with the two crowded comments. Kitty looks great. Storm looks great. But there's just too much going on. So we are all over the place for this one. And it kind of this is going to make for an interesting, interesting review. All right, well, let's move on. Jarrett, what's your one through five on this? Uh, before I reveal my exceptionally low score, I want to show the audience uh, something interesting that I just now noticed. As you guys know, I read them in the essential reprints, black and white mm-hmm. inks only. It's not as busy. I just realized that the buildings at the bottom of the poster and the floating, uh, the big floating head of additional storm, I guess, those are all put in post. That's done in a like a oh like the term for it just fell out of my head almost xeroxed in later on but and they didn't exist in the original art making it much less busy but that's the route they went and so yeah your boy's gonna have to say it's a two uh i can't go any lower than a two on a uh cockrum cover and i do like kitty's classic outfit all right thank you for showing us the black and white on that that was Really interesting to see it that way without that. Yeah, they uh, really that busy filler in that background. Or, yeah, in post production, which I think didn't help them a lot, or maybe it did because it made the poster full. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I am going to be at a three on this one. I liked it. I again, it's it's a solid cockroom. You know, Jason, where are you at on this cover? I'm going to join uh, you and Delvin as a three like i like i said it's a good um it's a good cover artistically uh as far as from marketing perspectives and whether it would go on my wall uh no so three for me all right seems we are a group divided into a five three and a two and some variety in the chat as well let's go ahead and see where things are at on the story with the story synopsis by jason
All right. Well, this one's called Kitty's Fairy Tale. Once upon a time, Kitty Pride told a bedtime story version of the Dark Phoenix Saga to young Ilyana Rasputin. That story featured our beloved heroes told in fairy tale fashion in which they are pirates, princes, genies, and wizards. And now my brother will poop all over it. The end. That is the most accurate <laughs> sir, synopsis you've had. Not only was it a great synopsis of the story, but an actual synopsis of how the rest of this episode is going to go. <laughs> so that's a two. I, know, I, I might one. change my mind. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and find out. Let's get to the bric a on this one. Uh, is it a first read or a reread, Rick? I think I know your answer. Yeah, I've read this multiple, multiple, multiple times. All right. Well, good for you. And that's exciting to know that nostalgic feel that people have for this. I, you know, I got some comics that same way myself. Delvin, first read or a reread? We all know you're talking about Captain Carrot, Pat. Yes, I know. You know so. <laughs> I love me something. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got a sugar coat around us, man. We've known each other too long. <laughs> all right. Um, I have not read this. This is the first read for me. Jason, first read or reread? Uh, like I said, it was a gap in my collection. First read for me. Jarrett, first read or reread or no read? Partial read. Partial read. All right. And it is a first read for me. So, woo All right. Well, we tried. We definitely tried. The saddest rainbow. The saddest rainbow. I'm- Man, you guys are all just hating the fact that I'm on this episode, aren't you? No. <laughs> no. no. I'm wondering. We, we yeah, need okay. you here. Yeah. <laughs> we need you here. When we were talking about the cover, I'm wondering, is this one that's a little more expensive? You know, that it, that you don't see it in some of the, you know, the cheaper bins. In Man, the, well, you're uh, not going to see it in a cheap bin, but I looked uh, I looked it up when we were talking about it uh, on our text chat a couple of days ago. You get about 12 bucks. Not too bad. Yeah, yeah not, not too bad. So you're not going to find it in the low, though. So it might be a little bit harder to find. They have to pay Jared 12 bucks to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little more. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into some high lows or what does for this. We'll start with Rick. You got a high, low, or what the? I could do a lot of highs about this book. I'm going to probably be doing a lot of defending about this book later on. But I'm going to start off by saying what this book is giving to the X-Men lore down the line. And there's a lot of things that come out of this book as a starting point for a lot of stuff in the future. So you may think it's actually filler, but it's not. There is actually one fairly regular character that is introduced more or less through this book, just in concept and actually on the cover. And then there is I was wondering that. And then there's an idea of a character in the Banffs and the kind of mini night crawlers that has been used even up until a very recent issue of, of uh, comics where, where one of those characters was actually part of the, of the comic book. So Lockheed as a character is introduced here, of course, in the future, it's more, the size of the little dragon on the cover than the large dragon that she's talking about. But this is actually what 12 issues prior to when that character is actually introduced into the comic book. And they're kind of play testing the idea here, or they're taking the idea from this and saying, well, we're going to use this in the future. So there's a lot of little things that get introduced just through this concept. And there are storylines that are taking off from what's in this book as well. So it may feel like a filler. It may look like a filler, and it is a bit of a interesting way of doing a clip show, but they're setting up a lot of different things that are really well used future in the future for X-Men uh, lore, for X-Men ideas. And it's a good character building uh, arc for Kitty Pride. It's another way to really get her into, into the comic book and into the setting. I know that before Jason had mentioned that they were trying to sell Kitty Pride a lot. Yeah, this was one of Chris Claremont's favorite characters that he wanted to really showcase. And I thought this was a good use of her in this setting, telling the story and introducing her and being part of the team. And it's a nice break in between a couple of storylines, too. So I think there's a little bit more in here than than you realize just in first glance at it. But that's my high that I'm starting off with. Oh, definitely appreciate the extra knowledge that you're bringing for future things to come with this and i was wondering if this was like the first appearance of kind of lockheed or kind of how how that went here and as you mentioned too knowing some future 
X-Men lore and all that. Within the last few years with Kitty, when she went all kind of piratey yeah. in the Krakora years, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I was like, oh, I'm wondering, this is kind of referencing back to her where she was, you know, doing that piratey stuff again. Yeah, that's actually a good call. Uh, recently, Kate Pride has been more of kind of a pirate with the Krakoa eras. And mm-hmm. this is yet another callback that she could they could be using with it. So very cool stuff. With that, let's go to Jason. Hi, lower what the? I'll give it a high. As a filler, this book is picking up at the end of the X Men have been through a lot of things, and they're literally picking up the pieces of their mansion from their last adventure. And there is something very heartwarming by the end of it, how they all come together. And there's like a need for them to listen to this fairy tale because fairy tales are, you know, are sometimes what keep us going the belief that there is something better that there can be a happy ending and how she ends the ending with Jean defeating the dark phoenix um overcoming it and Jean and scott ending up together at the end really touches heart scott's heartstrings uh in a way that touched mine as well at the end so although it's 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 a fun you know, fun episode you know, to use my humor, heart, spectacle, and art, there is a bit of heart in here as well. There's a little poignancy that I appreciated. I agree. I think that ending and Scott just kind of melting a little bit was kind of cool to see. Delvin, hi, low, or what the? I was looking uh, after I read the book and was wondering why Chris Claremont uh, was so adamant about pushing Kitty Pryde. And my thought was, surely he has a daughter who he just absolutely just doted on. Um, And that would be one reason that he just had, like, you know, the love affair that he clearly had for Kitty. And that's not the case. Uh, At least from the research I did, he had uh, twin boys. And those are his only two kids. Uh, His mom is Jewish. So I guess um, by descent, that makes him half Jewish. And uh, Kitty Pride is Jewish. Uh, She's very well spoken about her faith. Uh, in the comic book. They bring it up quite a few times over her history. So uh, it's possibly that uh, Kitty Pride is kind of his representation of maybe his mom, possibly his grandmother. I don't know that for certain, just uh, a, a, a little bit of, let's say, uh, to use a Stephen Colbert term, truthiness uh, in it. So so I, I just kind of wonder uh, why, you know, he, because th- this is a book that it's clear that they kind of just wanted to highlight a kind of human side of Kitty. And they've done that quite a bit. They like over these like past about maybe a year or so, they have, you know, they of course mentioned that she's a kid, but she's very smart. Uh, but she absolutely has the vulnerabilities of being a kid, but she's trying very, very hard to be the very best X-Men that she can be. So uh, none of those are bad things, by the way. Like, I don't think that Kitty Pride has been forced really in any way uh maybe until this book and i didn't even think this was like an over-the-top forcing i just think that chris used this as an opportunity to be that palate cleanser and i didn't mind that i read it and i was like okay i see this for what it is and so like as much as like you know we've kind of joked about it and i can only speak for me i did not outright hate it i do think that reading it i thought i was like okay i see it yes it's kind of silly no, I don't see much of a need to read it again. But overall, I really didn't think it like it, it didn't offend me or anything like that. And I thought it was it wasn't bad. And by the way, I'm only you know keeping my comments contained for myself, not trying to down anyone else's comments, Tom, or sure. any comments that came before me. Appreciate your take on that as well. I think this was one like I felt like it was the filler episode or that issue of hey, it's downtime. Now we're going to, instead of playing baseball, they did a play instead, you know, and now hopefully the next issues move, you know, get the story going again. This is, you know, the typical X-Men, let's get the team together. Let's do a, you know, play some baseball, but instead we're going to do a play. And we'll I do want to more. read real quick, Pat, just a uh, comment from Matt Possel says this issue also gives Il- Ilyana a small moment of normalcy before her world turned into brimstone Senate poop <laughs> because yeah, uh, as Heck a, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as the she between uh, the New Mutants and the X Men, uh, magic has had quite the run uh, as an X Men, and it happened in kind of a drastic way. So seeing her as just an innocent 
uh, child was like, oh, wow. Yeah. Hadn't seen her like this in some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like Rick was kind of saying, there's some stuff going that come out of these. And it was kind of cool to see her as well, too, as as a young, young girl (laughs) before all that stuff happens. Jared, you got a high, low or a what the? Hmm, Shockingly, I have a low. Albert Alvis in the chat made a good point. He said, keep in mind, this could be a jump on point for new readers. We saw that in Amazing Spider-Man a couple of times. Here's the problem. <laughs> About 15 issues or so ago, we did a jump on point for new readers when it was Scott leaves the team and it had that gorgeous cover, but it was like all just sort of the history of the X-Men. And we all pretty much agreed it was boring. It was like you get on a bus and a kindly old man sits down and says, let me tell you the story of the X-Men from the very beginning. And, he, and you're like, okay, you know, I'm going to be polite and listen to this story. But Are you sure he didn't say, hey, why don't you come on over to this pool and join me? <laughs> yeah, well, chew the fat, you know. <laughs> but now imagine that same old man said, hey, come over here and let me tell you the story of the X-Men. I'm going to tell it through the dreams of a 14-year-old girl. No, thank you. I'm I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Here's the problem. I still don't think Chris Claremont knows how to write a 14 year old girl. It, it just, and he's been, as Jason mentioned, and I think we've all noticed, he's been trying to sell us his character for a while. And he writes her like she's basically like in her 20s. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't play right. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't fit right for me. So that's a big, big part of it. So, as I started reading this book, I was like, oh, oh I think I know where we're, <laughs> where we're headed. You know, we got about three pages of story. And then I'm going to tell you the tale of, and I went, oh, okay, here we go. And uh, yeah, it, it, I didn't enjoy the last recap issue. I didn't enjoy the quote unquote clever uh, version of this time. I already hinted at the fact that I didn't finish it. I was like, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> and uh, it, it's X-Men's always been a tough world to get me into. And I've now found two versions that don't help with that. The end. The end. All right. Well, you know, this is all about getting people's thoughts on it. Sometimes we're going to be all on the same page. We're going to have fun. Some there's sometimes people are just, just not going to be for them. And that's okay. We all. Jared, I had to step away. Could you repeat that? Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry. I'll catch it later. (laughs) And much like Delvin, I'm not trying to rebut anyone or refute anyone. This is my take. That's how it went down for your boy. Jared, the salty guy who just can't get X-Men to work for me. Yet, there's still time. Yeah, well, there's definitely moments. I mean, there's there's been some story arcs I've given fives to. I mean, yes, exactly. This seems like every time we get to a recap, sort of like Auburn Elsa jumping on. Yeah, you just want to get to it. You just want to get to it. The last one was too boring. This one was too uh, whatever (laughs) that's out there. You you know, what? after I got done reading this, I kind of felt like, I under I kind of understood what they were going on and, and uh, that fairy tale kind of as, aspect to it. And here's what came to my mind. I'm going to say the statement and tell me if you get it. Hello, my name is Prince Cyclops. You killed my wife. Prepared to die. I mean, I get it. But yeah, I get, get it. it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's kind of like that. I'm really entertained by that. You killed my girlfriend. Prepared to die. I kind of got it. I was like, yeah, I like I liked it. Interesting. Well, let's go ahead and get to round two. Rick, you got another high. Or you got something else. As far as the story itself, and I know that we've been saying recap or retelling of story. I don't see it as a recap. And as far as the retelling, yeah, it's retelling the story of, of Phoenix, but it's, it's not, it's a reimagining if it could be better. And it's not trying to explain the history of the X-Men because it's, it's not, it's just her telling a story. It's a filler issue in and of itself. As for the story that is being told, I found it absolutely charming. I find it fun. I find it silly. I find it to be the good parts of what I want to see a what if world. If we go and make some certain changes and we do a what if story, this is a what if story that I wouldn't mind reading because it's kind of like what happened, but just a little bit different with the reimagining of the characters in a fun and different way. And I like that imagination. I like what comics and the comic book industry can give us with these kinds of books and with these kinds of opportunities. We can take characters that we love. We can take characters that we enjoy seeing and we can envision them in different ways and we can put them in different settings and we can challenge people to 
go beyond the expectation of what we have in front of us. We may want the characters to act and to go a certain way. We want to take our toys out of the toy chest and get the G.I. Joe figures and battle them this way and have them G.I. Joe figures here and the He-Man figures are in our Transformer figures here. We want to retell stories with those characters in different ways ourselves. And as a kid and as an adult, I like reading through stories where it challenges you to use those toys in different ways and use those characters in different ways. And I think that that's what what really speaks to me when reading this book is what Chris Claremont is doing with these characters that we like and that he has helped develop. And I like that about that. I also did want to call out one other thing before I give away my all my time, my own lovely connection to the book. And that is the editor at this time is Louise Simonson, Wheezy Simonson, who is the, the person who came up with power pack. So this is right before she goes on to and starts developing power pack. This is what she was doing before that. She was the editor of the X-Men books. And there's a reason why when I look in my own DNA about the comics that I enjoy, it all goes back to X-Men and Chris Claremont and Wheezy Simonson. Those are the ones that I read when I was a kid. And those are the ones whose work I really enjoyed. So I like seeing what they deliver and provide and it makes me happy. So those are my highs. That's very cool to see that how something like this has kind of moved you in your trajectory in life. So very cool. Jason, high, low, or what the? I'm going to go with a what the, I guess more of a question. And maybe, maybe Rick knows some of the answer to this. I got the sense that this was inspired by another comic that we've read a little bit about during our Crusade Miss, which was Elf Quest. I noticed one of the characters, like one of the fairy characters, was named Peeny in the book. Someone and they're wearing definitely... an Elf Quest shirt in this book. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah King Pride was, was wearing right. an Elf Elf Quest shirt too. Yeah, oh. so so I'm wondering if that was if this story was influenced by Elf Quest, and I'm trying to remember the history of it because it, I think Elf Quest was just kind of getting started around this time, right? I, I think so. I've never really read too mm-hmm. much of Elf Quest. I haven't read any of it really. Yeah, it's been Elf. Yeah, but it's been about yeah. for a long period of time. And I have no doubt that there was probably some influence. And in the fact that she's wearing the shirt, that's a key right there. Claremont and Cochran and all of them, they, they would tip their hat a lot of times when they had any kind of influence or any kind of nod to anybody that they wanted to. He has Kitty wearing cats laughing t-shirts and call out to a lot of different uh, a lot of different other creators and a lot of different people who are inspiring him and He's pretty open about it, so I would think so. ElfQuest at Marvel starts in 1985, so about four years from now. But yeah, this is definitely the indie phase for ElfQuest. I remember some other issues where he's definitely influenced by like Star Trek or Star Wars. There, there were a couple uh, really kind of heavy references to those pop culture icons. As I was reading this, I was like, I'm definitely picking up an ElfQuest vibe and, and noticed the little clues that were dropped in there. So. Interesting little, just little aspect of it. Very cool catch on that, Jason. Jert, we'll go to you for a final high, low, or what the? Well, Delve doesn't need to go, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to save. I understand. No, I to Delvin, get you, get you just, in and maybe help yeah, Delvin. Yeah, I know Delvin didn't get to hear me on last round, so at least he'll get to hear me this time. And I'm going to play off of something that Rick said and something that Jason said. Rick said, this is kind of like a what if, and he's right. This would make a great what if book. Not necessarily an X-Men book. <laughs> uh, it's definitely got that Elseworlds feel, and then which ties next to what Jason said. Jason said this felt heavily influenced by ElfQuest. And, he, and I was like, you know what? You're right. And I did catch the fact she was wearing that shirt at the beginning. And then Jason mentioned how Claremont will do these sort of referential issues. This one's a referential Star Trek. This one's referential. And every time he does that, I don't enjoy it. It seems to be when he's doing him and his own thing, R.E. The, the Doctor Doom saga that we did, which was great. I love what he does. But every time he tries to riff on something, it just doesn't land for me. But I won't end it with a low. The Dave Cockrum art, whether it was you know in the regular universe or in the storytelling universe, is fantastic. Dude can't be stopped. So it's a great looking book. And that's where I'll leave it. You are right. That is some solid Cockrum artwork that is happening right there. Cock of the walk. There we go. Yeah. Now we got Nick. There you go. <laughs> Delvin, hi, lower. What the? I mean, he's just a man like you and me, except that, you know, when he puts his pants on, he draws good comics. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. I, your laughter means the world to me. Uh, I just want to at least add a little bit about like the X Men part itself. One, like, and it, it, it did mention it. It was kind of cool that while she was telling her story, that all of the X Men slowly gathered and kind of listened uh, to what was going on. I thought that was very cute and very endearing, uh, particularly given everything that's happened. Just the heaviness of the book to where even they said at the start, Wolverine was like. Oh, good grief. We like, like this was a knockdown drag out, you know, session to even my standards. So there is that part of it. And I also give uh, Chris a lot of credit for introducing elements that some books don't necessarily particularly given like, and, like I've read some of the uh, current Avengers and like the damage that happens to these cities would just take decades <laughs> to recover from. And they never discuss any of it. They just move on, you know, to the next crisis. And so what, uh, no pun intended on crisis, but what but happened in this book is where you had uh, Professor X and the team repairing the mansion after everything, or at least breaking down everything and getting it, you know, deconstructed so that they could start reconstructing the mansion once again. And you've got Professor X like, man, am I going to have to mind wipe somebody at the bank to give me some money? <laughs> I'm broke, son. I'm tired of rebuilding this mansion. So I maybe, knew maybe, it's, maybe it's time for Angel to come back on the team. That's like, exactly what I right? thought. He, said, yeah. he was yeah. like, we're yes. broke. I was like, where's Angel? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Warren Worthington III, we need your cash here pronto. We need like, our you... number one X-Man. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's like Angel's not in a room, like right about the fire. It's like, do you think we have this joke of a pretty boy on the team because of his brother? <laughs> Man, good to see you, buddy. <laughs> so, yes, uh, I, I I do like that bit of realism that was put in because I think even in the X universe, they kind of, you know, strayed away from it because they just went, you know, only, you know, Krakoa, Mars, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, it's been interesting just kind of seeing this down to earth part of it, too. That really reminded me that what we see in the background while the story is being told is the actual team building of them getting together and they're listening and having community listening to the story and enjoying and the friendly ribbing, the friendly making fun of each other that is going on. So it's helping to connect them as a family instead of just people who fight together. Definitely agree. It's one of those bonding moments, bonding issues again, for sure. With that, why don't we find out who went the extra mile for this issue? We either fictitiously or just doing some housework and cleaning up around the yard. Mm. Rick, who went the extra mile for you? Yeah, I'm going to give it to Getty. This is her fairy tale. This is her story that she's telling. She's spinning one heck of a yarn for Ileana, and she is entertaining not only her, but she's entertaining the rest of the team as well. Great pick. I, as well, choose Kitty, too. Jason, do you choose Kitty or somebody else? Well, I was going to choose Jared because when I read this, I was like, oh, oh it's going to be an extra mile if he reads all this. <laughs> he he didn't. I didn't make it. I, didn't. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I got to choose someone else. I'm going to choose Lockheed because he literally carried them all the, those miles <laughs> <laughs> to, to have that adventure. And uh, and he was always there. He was blowing fire on the Phoenix. So I'll give it to Lockheed. Not a bad pick as well. Jared, do you have somebody that went the extra mile? Of course, sometimes even the most uh, subtle characters make you want to know more about them and their stories and all that. So I'm picking up on Fozzie Bear from the Muppets uh, on page three. Gotta love <laughs> Fozzie. Actually, I, I'm just kidding. Uh, my extra mile award goes to uh, Rick Heineken from Unpacking the Power of the Power Pack. He clearly has a love for this, and it, I know it's hard for him to probably hear somebody who doesn't, but I think that's cool. I mean, you meet people who they, you know, they love certain movies that you're just like, why, you know, I don't, I don't get it. And a younger version of Jared would, would battle those people. I have no interest in battling, you know, Rick or other people who love this book. If you love it, love it. That that's cool. You know? And I bet maybe if I had read it when I was, you know, six or so, uh, um, I might have a much greater appreciation for it as well. So, I'm glad Rick was here to <laughs> shine a light on the positives of the book. Cause I hate, hate, to, you know, on the network, I don't like being the boat anchor, but I'm also going to be honest with everybody. So 
I'm glad there's an appreciation for it. I'm glad it has a nostalgia factor for him and others. Just remind everybody that I'm coming to this at 47, never having read it before, and it just doesn't it doesn't ring well. But there's a lot of things like that that you know. I went back and I tried to watch. Uh, well, try to I did watch a lot of those John Hughes teen movies that I didn't see in in the 80s, and and they don't ring as well for me as a 40 something year old mm-hmm. man. Uh, but I can see where it could. So. I do definitely want to end on the positivity. Rick kind of can get to my extra mile for being an absolute champion of this. And I think that's just fine. I always like to quote one of my favorite podcasts. It's called we hate movies. And it's these four guys from New York who just rip into movies. They will watch it and they will make fun of it and joke. They're a comedy podcast. And they always like to say, it's okay to like this movie. It's okay to like a movie and it's okay to hate a movie. You don't have to take our opinions. We are doing this for fun. We're going to make fun of the movie, but it's okay to like it and it's okay to hate it. And either way, we aren't going to, we aren't here to change your minds on it. And, and it's not even trying to change minds, just trying to emphasize the things that I like. It's perfectly fine for you to emphasize the things and explain the things why you don't like it too. And we are adults now. And I think we've all been through the times in our lives where it's like, no, you must like what I like, or I must rip down and, and destroy the thing that you love because that's the way I am. Yeah, we don't need to do that anymore. Uh, I can appreciate, and I do appreciate you and everybody on this network for your honest opinions of these things and the things that you like or dislike about different books. So it's okay to disagree. It's fine, but you, <laughs> you're not going to take away my love for it. And I don't think, and I can hopefully make you understand it. If not, you're not never going to love it, but at least I can make you understand why I like it. I understand why you like it. Hopefully, I have eloquently. Mm-hmm. expressed why I don't enjoy as much. Yep. And Kathy in the chat says I've already crossed the line on making comments about John Hughes. Although I will say Uncle Buck is one of the greatest movies ever made. And that's a John Hughes film. <laughs> that is true. Well, I think that's the nice thing is that we can have this fun discussion about the pros and the cons that we think and still continue to be friends. And that's what this is all about. Speaking about being friends, let's go to Delvin. Delvin, you got somebody that's, Went the extra mile for you. Don't really see any other choice. I'll I'll say Kitty in that it was designed for her to kind of be the star of the book, you know, mm-hmm. and there wasn't a ton of action that happened in real time uh, of the book. So I'm fine with giving it to Kitty. A solid choice as well, I think, with this one. So with that, let's go ahead and get to the ratings for this issue. Again, it's a one through five rating. Five is you loved it. It gave you a ring to swing from. Four, you really liked it. Three liked it two didn't like it and one you hated it it turned you into a baby rick one through yeah, five i'm gonna go ahead and give it my five and and i will say that probably story-wise it would probably land as a four but my nostalgia oh, factor alone yeah. that's giving bump it a bump up. up for me so i have to go with a five with this it's got a place in my heart and it's never gonna go away <laughs> totally understand that one so with that we'll go to jason I'm at a three. I liked it. I don't think it's uh, it's I've read it for the first time. Uh, didn't offend me in any way. I thought it was creative. I kind of agree with Jared a little bit. I think when Claremont gets a little over influenced, that influence can be overused in the book from time to time. Um, but at, for this one, I don't know. It just felt like a, a, a fun little refreshing tale wove its way into the, into our story arc nicely and had a nice ending that the X-Men could appreciate in the real world to help them get through a tough time. So three for me. Jared, one through five. Now, you know, my policy is to give it like a one if I don't finish it. I will bless this with a two because Cockroach can draw like nobody's business. All right. So but giving a bump up for the Cockrum art. Yeah, I mean it's killer. It's it, is. it looks great. It looks great. Again, I read it in the black and white, so I'm watching the pure ink work mm-hmm. of Rubenstein here, and it's fantastic. All right. Delvin, one through five. As a friendly reminder to uh viewers and listeners, uh if you have a Cockrum bump, please seek medication. Uh Bot Boy Versus gives it a four. And Matt Posso says, I give this issue a four, a fun take on recapping an important story. Courtney Holland says a five because it's the X-Men. I'm at a three. I, it's, it's one of those like, you know, I see as a three, 
would I ever feel the need necessarily to run back and read again? Probably not. But I understood what it was, understood its purpose. I also understand that whatever X-Men 154 is, should we be reading it, isn't going to be anything like this. It'll be back to the continuity of what happens. Not like this wasn't in in continuity because it was, but it's going to be more, you know, that X-Men action that we have uh, grown, you know, to love and appreciate it and a part of what uh, has made Chris Claremont the legend that he is. That said, to Rick and to someone like Matt Posso in the comments and others, books like this also add to that canon too. So we can't take away from that. But as for me, I'm at a three. I will agree with you guys at a three as well. I enjoyed it. Again, I thought it was a good kind of in-betweener. It wasn't baseball, but it was a good kind of little play story that they did. And with that, that's going to bring us to the end of this part of the show. You got a comment or a question, go ahead and send us an email at contact at longboxcrusade.com or write a comment on the X, Facebook, or Instagram pages. With that, we will be right back. Hi, I'm one of the high priests of Conchu Ray, and I have the sacred privilege of providing you, the loony listener, with a podcast honoring Marvel's very own Moon Knight. So join me and a host of others at Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or support the show by becoming a Patreon member. Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. It's time to get your conchu on. Welcome back from the break. Now let's get to the feedback part of the show where we share your comments, emails, questions, and shares in a segment called Crusader Comments. We are thrilled to kick off these comments with special shout outs to our Crusaders Club members. These are the fine folks that have joined our crusade. They enjoy early access to special long box episodes, voting to help determine show content and so much more. So these are the folks reaping the benefits and giving some much appreciated support to the show. Alan W. Wright. And Helica Wolf. Ow. Oh, Auburn Elvis. Bill Beer. Braxton Underwood. Clinton Robeson. Captain Entropy. Clark Westfield. Dave Collins. Battlewagon. Eric Porter in the chat. Ezra Gallo. Gary V. Gene Hendricks. Gerald Green. Heinz K. Eric Hodges, who's also new that I just saw. Eric just joined us today. Jason Keen. Jason Lady. My boy, Jeff Bollier. Jeremy L. Jim Jarman, Jim Jarman, Jim Jarman, Jim Jarman. I hope you like Jim Jarman, too. Jim Meal. Musical genius, Joe Thomas. John Watson. Josh Strickland. Candace Ward. Kathy Bright, the MVP. Matt and Missy Toiso. Matt Ross. Mark Ross. Maxwell Traver. Miranda W. P.D. Devins. Paul Hicks. Rick. From Rick and Jeff. Jeff and Rick present. <laughs> Rob Morgan, Sam Anthony, Sean Urbanski, Spreadsheet, Spidey67, Steve Cronin, Tim Price, Tony Pennington, Toronto Cop. If we missed anyone on our list, we apologize. Keep in mind that we record these episodes well in advance of release, so if you're a recent addition, we should be adding you soon, but don't worry about it, y'all. Let us know we missed you by sending an email to contact at longboxcrusade.com. We'll take care of it. As a reminder, you can become a Crusaders Club member by heading over to patreon.com slash longboxcrusade. For as little as $1 a month, you'll get access to the amazing world of the Crusaders Club. Come check it out. Don't have any extra money? Times are tough. We understand. Please take a moment to write a review on Apple Podcasts for this podcast or anywhere that you happen to be listening to this podcast. If you just want to keep it short with Just Star Ratings, it will help raise the profile of our show, and we will share your review on the next show. For instance, uh, we're going to talk about some social media shares and retweets from Amazing Spider-Man Chronicles episode 76 from June 1981. That's not when we did it. That was just the episodes. The Amazing Spider-Man 220 and Uncanny X-Men 149 were the issues that we cover. A thank you to... Tomas um, at B-Raid1991, Scotty Cameron, Magazines of Monsters, and Prairie Justice, the Greg Sanders Vigilante Podcast. And now we will read a few social media comments. I will go ahead and take the first one there from the Hammer Strikes. That was my first ever Spidey com- Spider-Man comic book. 
The Moon Knight stuff confused me since I had no knowledge of him, but it's a great story with some great art. I'll take the next one from Scotty Cameron. And Scotty says, I wonder what Moon Knight's karma count looks like. We get Spidey and Aunt May's karma count. And now I wonder how Moon Knight did. I was also wondering how many hosts have seen the Saw movies, given the lack of familiarity with the Saw theme. Hello, Zeppo. Or Z- Hello, Zip. <laughs> so yeah, that's my familiar. I don't. I've seen, I think almost all, I think all Saw, Saw movies. I think I saw the first two or maybe three. I've seen like one or two. It just kind of became like misery porn. And I was like, eh, it it just, mm." (laughs) but then again, that's me and horror movies. though. some people absolutely love the genre. Just not that you just said, Rick, not my bag. No, I've, I've skipped out on those ones. They've just never, I know the themes beyond them all. I've just never have been interested. Yep. Yep. Well, let me explain to you why you should love it, Rick. I'm just kidding. <laughs> different, 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 different podcast, different podcast, and, and I don't. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> see, that's what I see. Never mind. All right, <laughs> so we've got Max Traver who said, "I vividly remember that X Men issue. It looms way larger in my personal X canon than it probably deserves. Must catch up and catch this episode." Uh we might have lost Max on this, <laughs> and it's my fault. But uh, don't worry, I there, Max. I- I kept Max here. That's I kept right. Max Rick, here for us. Rick lifted up. Rick lifted it up for us. Uh, hey, the next one, spoiler, it's got star jammers in it. So could be fun. That could be fun. Could be a good one. It's actually a good one for the star jammers. And we got one off of Spotify from Scotty Cameron, who says, great episode. Love the discussion about Spider-Man's first encounter with Moon Knight and a spooky X-Men story. Scott is good at getting his name mentioned twice on our podcast. He's done that a few times with Transformers Chronicles, which uh, we greatly appreciate there. And we certainly greatly appreciate it here, too. Uh, Spotify listeners, if you are checking us out, by all means, please let us know. You know, give us a like over there or subscribe and make a comment. We will read it. Voicemail. You can do that, too. You can call us and leave us a voicemail. We'll play on this show. You leave us a message at 707-532-5269. That's 707-532-LBOX. I got to the mute button late. (laughs) Hi, and you get to hear that song in beautiful stereo. And thank you to everyone for the likes, shares, follows, and comments. We do appreciate your friendship and your help in spreading the word about this podcast. And that's the show. Be sure to check out the website, longboxcrusade.com, where posts will be made for journaling this crusade. I want to thank Rick, Jared, Jason, and Delvin for joining me on this episode. But before we go, let's find out where the listeners can find us on the internet and send your hate film messages to via DMs. <laughs> and we'll start with Rick. Well, you can find me over on the show that I host, which is called Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. And I do that with my co-host, Jeff, who I have to routinely check out of the Restwell nursing home because he is old and he's also a supervillain. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the podcast name again? Unpacking the power of Power Pack. It's a Power Pack. Power pack was <laughs> I, was, oh, I almost did it, but he was like on his roll. I didn't want to get. It. I didn't want to me neither. I wanted. I was to with you I, saw, <laughs> I, I saw where you guys are going to. I saw what you're laying down. I served it to you. All right, Delvin. Where can you be found? Sometimes on. Wait, have, have I been on an episode of Unpacking the Power of the Power Pack? Uh, I think I've been on one. Right? Yeah, you are. You uh, yeah, came on when we were doing our New Warriors. Uh, run thing that's right that's right uh, it was also. an experiment and i will never do that again it was too much <laughs> that's been our experience with delvin as well no no that's no it wasn't, it wasn't that we, we covered a lot of issues in one episode and it was horrific and it was an experiment and we decided not to do that again all right y'all you can find me uh de underscore rey on twitter uh also delvin ray on instagram jason you can find me at Jason Albrick on Instagram and on threads. Jared. I am at Yard Sale Artist at X and Facebook and Instagram. You can check out my artwares at www.theyardsaleartist.com. I know we don't do a lot of politics on the show, but I'm also on the Senator Kelly re-election campaign. So be sure to help me out with that. <laughs> Uh, you know what I should have dropped off for you? I've got a couple of bumper stickers for you. Get, I have some. You've given me yes, some yes. in the past. Yes. <laughs> I, I would also, if if I could also, if you go to our website, Jeff and Rick present, 
and you put in Jeff and Rick present tales of tales. My daughter has started to do her own comic strip. It's coming out every other week. And I do not mind plugging it because my daughter is a really good artist and she's pretty good cartoonist. She's got some good comedy beats and I really am enjoying promoting her work. Jeff and Rick present tales of tales. I got some of her original artwork up on my fridge. Yep. All right. That seems like uh, I've seen that come through some posts and they look very fun and well done as well, too. So I think Jason would kind of like that. It's all about the cats, I think. Yeah, I got uh, she did some uh, character sketches of my of my cats. Let her up on the fridge. Oh, that's awesome. And I can be found at Christatos Zero One. And if you want to interact with us via live chat and be entered in to win some free stuff on our live raffles, just like we're recording this episode now, it is live in front of a YouTube audience and other social media sites. Join us in our next episode of a doing it live stream on YouTube. It's the second Sunday of every month, except for if it's Mother Day or another holiday, we will move it on to the next week. And that will be at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. So go ahead and check out Lombok Crusade on YouTube. And please remember to subscribe and hit that bell so you get notifications of when we go live. Thank you for listening, and we hope you have enjoyed this episode of Amazing Spider-Man Chronicles. You got a comment or a question, email us at contact at longboxcrusade.com or leave a comment on the Longbox Crusade Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter page, all at Longbox Crusade. Until next time, take care and please join us on the next episode as we continue on the crusade to The intro music is provided by musical genius Joe November. Check out his SoundCloud at J O S E F L I N 99. You won't regret it. All songs, song clips, and characters discussed are copyright of their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended. We are just fans that like to share our love of comics. Outtakes. Oh, Pat's got frosted tips. That's what yeah. that is. Ah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do this myself. It's just for old men. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had, you know, if I could frost my tips again, I'd, I think it'd be cool. You could do what now? You know, yeah. I, had my, I was I was kind of grungy. I was, you know, that, that had that look where I had. Wait, wait, wait. Grunt, frosted tips was a grunge thing? I don't know. It was the 90s. It's a boy I band did, thing. I did something. That was a boy band thing. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that, was either, that was either Flock of Seagulls or boy band. <laughs> it was not grunge. <laughs> grunge was not, was doing nothing with you. Yeah, grunge was like was having a hair nothing, here. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, all right. Well, yeah. maybe I got it. Well, I still listen to it, but, you know. Like a flannel lumberjack shirt. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That was me. Yeah. I had that. Heart, that, heart that you never wore outside. <laughs> I see Delvin giving me the motion. It's the motion in the okay. that, was, that was the motion. That was, you are looking at this. I knew it was the motion. Skills. I'm going on mute. I'm doing my. That's my bad. That's my uh, skills. Hey, start the damn show. Amazing Spider Man Chronicles is a podcast that will journal the Amazing Spider Man comic books issues in my. Uh, I'm screwed. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Only 79 times we fresh. Okay. Only 79 times. On 81, you're going to nail it. I'm going to nail it. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it right, guys. I know it. Just <laughs> give me another try. I'll get it right. Here we go. One more try. I'm sorry. Here got Pat. No, no, don't no, no, get distracted. <laughs> Put your podcast around me. One more try. Saying all these crater names are hard for me. Won't you let me give it one more try? Pat! All right, here we go. I almost had a panic attack. Like, did I write a synopsis? <laughs> oh, Spidey, right? Am I right? <laughs> he, he, did some, he did some things, and the vulture was like, ah, ah, and Spidey was like, mm-mm. And, and our man was like, could you give me some info mail? Uh, okay. Um. <sighs> For the record, the guys that are on Island Chump are the guy who rated it the highest and the guy who rated it the lowest. We now have to live together on Chump Island. <laughs> That is kind of awkward, isn't it?